Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to our panel on trials of separation, uh, trials of suspicion, segregation, and selective service. Uh, this afternoon, we have three great speakers who will share with you the confinement sites where three judicial or quasi judicial processes were convened for incarcerees. Uh, Matt Lotzenheimer, Matt, I'm sorry. Matt Lotzenheiser at Fort Missoula will tell you about the Alien Enemy Hearing Boards, which were held to determine whether 1,000 Issei arrested on flimsy allegations of disloyalty could be released back to their families in a WRA camp or transferred to an Army internment camp for another two years of imprisonment. Second, we'll hear from Stan Shikuma. He'll tell you about Tuli Lake, where hearings were given to each of the 12,000 who refused to register their loyalty or who answered no in a questionnaire. And I'm Frank Abe, by the way. I'll share with you stories later about Heart Mountain and Minidoka, where close to 100 Nisei were tried in federal court for refusing to be drafted from camp on principle. So that's the program. Let's jump right into it. Um, just so we're clear, introducing uh, Fort Missoula. Uh, the alien internment camps run by the Department of Justice are distinct from the incarceration camps run for the vast majority of people by the War Relocation Authority. Fort Missoula in Montana held Issei arrested by the FBI, not only after Pearl Harbor, but also those arrested in a second sweep up and down the West Coast on February 21st, 1942. I myself was blown away when I discovered only this year that the confinement sites program helped fund restoration of the courtroom at Missoula. Uh, because that was where some characters I've been writing about uh, uh, for, the, for the last four years were, were brought before civilian hearing boards at Fort Missoula. And I, I'll have more, more to say about that later. So let's hear first from the executive director of the Historical Museum at Fort Missoula, Matt Lotzenheiser. Matt, go ahead. Thanks, Frank. I appreciate it. Uh, and you got my name perfect the second time through. So that's, that's exactly. <laughs> and trust me, you've not butchered it as bad as I've, I've heard it in the past. It's it's a hard name, but Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start by sharing my screen here. Everybody see? Yes. Um, okay, perfect. perfect. Um, so I guess one of the things before I, I get started, I do want to just say a quick, take a quick second to thank uh, Frank and Stan both. Uh, we've done some planning meetings for this, and both of them have been incredible to work with. Uh, the more folks I get to know through the Japanese American Confinement Sites Consortium, uh, I learn something from each and every one of them. And at the Historical Museum at Fort Missoula, we're so pleased to be part of that group uh, and so thankful that we've been able to gather. Um, we tend to find ourselves a little isolated sometimes in, in, in Missoula, Montana, so it's great to be able to meet with the other sites and get to know those folks and learn their stories. And of course, share the story of Fort Missoula with them as well, too. So one of the things I'd like to do, as Frank mentioned, our site is, is, is quite different from the WRA camps. Um, it's it's uh, different in the sense that none of the folks that were held at Fort Missoula were US citizens. Uh, at Fort Missoula, we actually had about 1,200 Italian nationals and along with 1,000 Japanese Issei men that were held there throughout the uh, World War II era. Um, the reason Fort Missoula was actually chosen as the uh, as an internment camp was that you know in the immediate aftermath of, of Pearl Harbor and actually even before Pearl Harbor, uh, they were looking for sites to house nationals, uh, and Fort Missoula actually had a ready infrastructure. Whereas unlike camps like Hard Mountain or other places that the infrastructure of the camp was actually built after Pearl Harbor, uh, our site existed prior to that, and the infrastructure there was created because of the uh, CCC. So during the 1930s, Fort Missoula was the regional, Northwest Regional Headquarters of the Civilian Conservation Corps. So every summer they would bring about 3,000 young men to the fort, they would be housed there, there was the infrastructure there to care for them, and then they would be trained and sent out to a variety of different projects uh, all over the United States, uh, or I should say all over the Pacific Northwest, uh, and that was everything from building forest service roads to trails in the national parks to construction projects. Uh, things like that. So because of that, um, there was this infrastructure that existed and when they needed a ready-made site, at, again, before Pearl Harbor even, uh, they chose a place like Fort Missoula. Um, so one of the other thing that makes us as a site a little bit different than, than some of our, our partners and, and uh, WRA sites is that um, 
Fort Missoula, because it existed prior to World War II and then continued to exist after uh, the internment era. And in fact, Fort Missoula was actually used as a military prison for court-martialed uh, military personnel after the, um, the internment camp was here. So they used a lot of the same infrastructure, but because of that, the buildings existed prior and then after the, the camp. So we actually, believe it or not, as a site have more original buildings that were used as part of that internment era than any other site in the United States. Uh, and many of those buildings still remain. So if you come to tour Fort Missoula today, you're still able to see many of the buildings uh, that would have been used. Um, the other thing that makes us a little bit different in, in the sense is that as a site, Fort Missoula is, is not necessarily, we tell many stories, so we aren't necessarily a confinement site in the sense that Fort Missoula is actually a community, community museum, very much kind of like a county historical society. So we tell a variety of different stories. We talk about Missoula history, Fort Missoula history, uh, the Buffalo soldiers who were here at Fort Missoula during the 1880s. Uh, as well as even the wood products industry and the railroad industry. But one of the one of the most important stories we tell is the one we're going to talk about today, which is about the DOJ camp that was here at Fort Missoula. And I think um, that began back in 2008 when we acquired a building, a quartermaster storehouse, where the original courtroom was located in. Uh, and I know I arrived here in 2014 as the executive director. And I think myself and my staff have really placed uh, an emphasis on telling that in internment story at Fort Missoula. We feel like it's 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 a much bigger story than just a community museum story. It's something that um, is important on a national scope and even international scope. So we've really made it a priority to raise awareness of this story uh, and to get involved with groups like the Confinement Sites Consortium uh, so that we can better uh, tell that story and learn how to interpret that history better. So. Okay, I'm going to start out with just so those are some of the just some general details about the camp that was here at Fort Missoula. Uh, there were a total of 2200 internees that were held at Fort Missoula between 1941 and 1944. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, 1200 were Italian nationals and 1000 were Japanese Issei men. We did have a very small contingent of Germans that were held at Fort Missoula that were German nationals living in the United States. We don't have a lot of information about them, but there were only about 29 of the, the German nationals. So the Italian nationals are kind of interesting, and I just will touch on them briefly uh, before we get into the, the Japanese Issei men. But uh, it was a very different population than the Japanese men that were here. The Italians that were here were primarily merchant seamen. So they were uh, ship workers that essentially were on vessels that were caught in US waters when war broke out in Europe. Uh, and this is as early as uh, mid-1941. So these men were working on the ships, war breaks out, the federal government impounded those Italian ships in US ports. And then after, um, after they'd been there a period of roughly 90 days, then the men that were on those ships had been in the United States exceeding that 90 day where you need a visa. So at that point they became illegal and they became, um, and they were essentially arrested at that point by our federal government. Uh, they were sent from the ports that they were in on to Ellis Island initially, and then by May of 1941, so full six months before, before Pearl Harbor, uh, these Italian men were imprisoned at Fort Missoula. So, and actually the Italian men helped to build the, the barracks that we all are, are used to seeing with the photos of the incarceration camps. The Italians lived in the old military barracks and actually helped to construct the other barracks um, that the Japanese and the Italians would eventually stay in once they were there. Um, in addition to kind of merchant seamen, uh, with our Italians, not only did we have these merchant seamen, but there were other folks like, uh, believe it or not, we actually had World's Fair workers. So there was an orchestra, there were chefs from New York City, there were people like that. Uh, but the demographics of the Italians are quite different. They were primarily young men. So these are men anywhere in age from 17 or 18 into their late 20s. Uh, which we'll find out here in a second that the, the Japanese men that were at Fort Missoula were, were a much different demographic than that. Um, the last thing I'll say about the Italians is just that um, unlike the Japanese Issei men, which were kind of here as almost a way station, they were brought here to be essentially interrogated and then, then put through this loyalty hearing process. Uh, the Italian men remained the entire war. So they actually spent three full years here at Fort Missoula before they released to return home or to be sent back to Italy. Um, whereas our Italian men, most of them were only here for a period of about three to six months, some longer than that, but the majority just to go through that 
uh, loyalty hearing process and move on from there. Okay, so we'll move on to the Japanese Issei men that were here at Fort Missoula. So this is a picture of some of the men arriving here at the fort. Uh, you can see their luggage in that. And then just some quick details about them. Um, all the men that were at Fort Missoula, none of them were US citizens. Uh, as most of you know, at the time, the, the laws of the, the day didn't allow someone of Asian descent that was not born in the United States to become a US citizen. So they were all living as essentially resident aliens uh, in, in the United States at the time of Pearl Harbor. Um, they were not, uh, again, not legally allowed to become US citizens. Uh, but many of them, because of that duration of being in the United States and being successful business owners, had reached a point where they were fairly successful and leaders within their community. The majority of them were uh, middle age or older. Uh, so, you know, you know, most of them were in that 50 to even 80 years old uh, when they arrived here at Fort Missoula, again, being community leaders. Um, one interesting thing you'll notice, I have used the term men. So by our records, we don't have any records of any women ever being sent to Fort Missoula, whether obviously not Italian with merchant seamen, but or the Japanese as well, too. So the entire population of the camp at Fort Missoula uh, were male. There is one story of a, a potential where a couple was arrested in Butte, Montana, and then they spent one night at Fort Missoula before being transferred onto another site. So it is possible that there would have been somebody that would have stayed over a night or so. Uh, but the rest of the folks that were actual residents of the Fort Camp uh, were all men. Um, the background of the men that came to Fort Missoula, again, I mentioned they're, they're community leaders. So you're talking people like businessmen, they were religious leaders, um, especially Buddhist and Shinto priests, uh, diplomats, fishermen, journalists. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the designations and the lists that they used here in just a second. So by, by the end of 1942, so uh, literally within you know, less than a month of Pearl Harbor, there were about a thousand Issei men that had been sent to Fort Missoula. Um, and the purpose of choosing Fort Missoula was again related to that courtroom. So because Fort Missoula had been a military post, there was a courtroom that had been used for court marshals uh, in the post headquarters building here at the fort. So that courtroom was then chosen to be able to conduct the, the loyalty hearings that would take place. Um, so I guess that brings us to the interesting question of, um, so Pearl Harbor happens on December 7th, and we know that by the end of the day on December 7th, uh, 633 Japanese men were, were detained. Uh, and the question is, how did, they, how did they know who to arrest? How did they know how to get them? And what we find the answer there is um, in these, what are called the ABC lists. And the ABC lists are, um, a list of people that were, were put together based on their membership in different organizations, uh, any sort of quote unquote evidence of potential for being disloyal, uh, which is incredibly tragic, but um, it was the way these lists were put together. So according to that designation, the A list were the people that were considered quote unquote most dangerous. And this included individuals who are members of kind of the 88 uh, Japanese organizations deemed a, quote unquote you know, constitute a threat to U.S. security. A B-list people were those who were considered that they might be dangerous or a potential threat to U.S. security. Again, there are 176 organizations. So the federal government started with the lists of these Japanese organizations in the United States, and then they were able to get member roles of those lists, and that's where the, the ABC list started. Finally, the third list, the C-list, were those who were considered, quote, possibly dangerous. Uh, and these are individuals with kind of, uh, they were referred to as semi-official or subversive Japanese firms, but this was so open-ended. It could mean anything from somebody that worked or owned a steamship company, banks, newspapers, uh, local businesses. Of course, I mentioned a little second ago about religious leaders, uh, Japanese language teachers fell on this list as well too. And essentially any prominent members of the Japanese community that were Issei men began on these lists. And believe it or not, these lists actually started, the federal government started compiling these lists as early as October of 1938. So well, well before Pearl Harbor. Um, a year later in 1939, J. Edgar Hoover uh, created a custody and detention list and he started with Italian and German nationals, but eventually Japanese Issei men were added to this list in 1941. Um, and in the immediate aftermath, the Pearl Harbor 
The Army wired all the commanding officers. They sent the, the list to FBI field agents. They sent that list to local police stations. I know there were a number of folks arrested by the Los Angeles police uh, at that time. So within hours, these lists were all distributed and there were officers sent out to arrest these Japanese Issei men that happened to appear on these ABC lists. So again, you can see that total of, you know, by the end of the day on Jan December 7th, they arrested 736 mainland Issei men. So loyalty hearings at Fort Missoula. So what I'd like to do now is just show a brief video and I'm gonna, hopefully I can get the tech to work on this. So I'm gonna show a brief video about the, the, the camp at Fort Missoula. By mid-January, there were a thousand Japanese held at Fort Missoula. The government- So, so Matt, we don't see it. You're not seeing it? Okay. Just... Now I'm gonna to need to go out and I'll yeah. read it there, okay? So let me do that. <clears throat> Matt's going to uh, bail out and sign back in with the video and then check this chair screen box. And Julie, we'll get to your question later. Okay. Frank, make sure you let me know if we can see this. By mid January, there were we'll a thousand it. Japanese held at Fort Missoula. The government decided that the best way to handle that was to decide. Uh, through hearings, whether they were likely to be disloyal, which is a really interesting concept, how you prove whether someone might commit a crime. The fates of the Japanese at Fort Missoula were determined by alien enemy hearing boards comprised of citizens selected by the Justice Department. Their task was to question each of the men individually to determine which were dangerous enemy aliens. Now, in the end, they were not found to be disloyal and were not found to be doing anything that was illegal, but that did not deter them from being held for the remainder of the war. Despite the fact that these Japanese men were not found to be disloyal, the hearings clenched control over the men's fate. Kept apart from their families, most of the men were transferred from Fort Missoula to Army internment camps or other Department of Justice camps. Others were paroled and allowed to join their families in war relocation authority camps. I know that the people who were here at Fort uh, Missoula were, were quite concerned. Uh, when they started segregating people to go to different camps uh, from Missoula, there were concerns that maybe some of them are going to uh, a place where they would be executed. And therefore, uh, uh, it, was, it was a tough time for a lot of people. This is the courtroom that's been restored to look as it did back in 1941 and 42 when the loyalty hearings were held here for the Japanese that were held at Fort Missoula. In 1938, the Army reconstructed this building, which was a chapel, a very large chapel, into being their administrative headquarters. And in there, as the Army, they needed a courtroom for court martials. So this room was actually built as a room in which to hold hearings for court martials. So it doesn't look much like a uh, courtroom might look that has a jury box, et cetera, because juries aren't involved in court martials, and nor were they involved in the loyalty hearings for the Japanese. The hearing board sat at the bench, and the other participants were down here at a table. OK. Frank, I'm going to try to share this again. That was great, Matt. Let me go ahead, and I'm going to go back to my other presentation here. There we go. Okay. So I just want to mention briefly, so that is a clip from a documentary film we did back in 2015 that was funded through a Japanese American Confinement Sites grant. Uh, the two people you saw in there were Diane Sands, who is a state senator here in Montana, as well as Carol Van Valkenburg. And Carol was the author of a book called An Alien Place, uh, which is the book that was done on our camp here at Fort Missoula. She's a retired professor of journalism at University of Montana, and she's done some really great research and been a wonderful partner with us here at the museum. Uh, I will say the total video is about 30 minutes long. And if anybody would like, um, feel free. I'll have my contact information up at the end. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to send you a link to that. Uh, it's a really wonderful video. It's a great summary of the camp and, and both groups that were here at Fort Missoula. Um, so I want to finish up uh, as a historian, uh, one of the things I like to do is that I, I like to be able to share 
uh, kind of a personal example of someone. So it's it's one thing in my mind to talk about. There were a thousand Japanese salmon here in Fort Missoula, but I think talking a little more in depth, and I could go into a couple of examples, but I want to use this one, which is one of the men that was held at Fort Missoula. And before I, I get into it, I do want to mention I I'm endlessly thankful to Russell Endo. Russell's done some wonderful archival research, and he's been very gracious in sharing these things with us here at the Historical Museum. Uh, and so a lot of the, the files, the uh, case files we have related to the internment camp at Fort Missoula and the men that were held here is thanks to Russell. So I don't know if he's on the line, but if he is, thank you, Russ. I appreciate it. So I want to talk about Kichitara Mudo, uh, who was one of the men that was held at Fort Missoula. And just to kind of go through and show you what his process was in being arrested and then sent to Fort Missoula. So he was actually arrested by the Los Angeles Police Department uh, on, you know, in the afternoon after Pearl Harbor. Um, he had been in the country for essentially decades, over 40 years at that point. Uh, you can see he was born in 1882 in Japan. Uh, he was the owner of, of the Cherry Blossom Cafe, which was on Broadway in Los Angeles, and he lived with his family on East 2nd Street in Los Angeles. Uh, at his trial, the evidence presented against uh, Mr. Muno was that, um, and this is fairly common in the files that I've read, he'd traveled back to Japan twice, uh, in both cases to visit his mother. Uh, that was used as evidence that he could possibly be subversive. Uh, he was a member of the Central Japanese Association of America. Um, he'd sent money back to Japan, which was another red flag that the FBI had. In his case, he sent $15 a year to a Japanese children's home. And then he donated $50 to the Japanese Naval Society in 1940. Uh, and in exchange for his $50, you can see he got a membership button. Uh, but he stated as part of the hearings and the interrogation that they did with him that he didn't consider himself a member of the organization. He was also uh, quite a mover and shaker in that uh, in the Los Angeles community. He played golf fairly often and socialized with the Japanese consul, and he belonged to various other uh, California JA groups. So just what you see here was essentially the evidence that was presented against him um, and which, which they used to justify his continued internment for the remainder of the war. Uh, some of the other details that they that they didn't talk about, which um, I find kind of interesting, is that uh, he was a philanthropist. I mean, he donated trees for the states of Washington and, and California. He had purchased U.S. war bonds prior to being being sent to Fort Missoula. Um, he did tell them in an interview that he wanted to become a U.S. citizen, but obviously he couldn't because of the laws of the day. He spoke out against the foreign policy of the Japanese government. And my favorite was he stated that he would fight for the United States against Japan, despite the fact that at the time he was arrested, he was 62 years old. Um, finally, I just wanna show you, this is kind of a timeline of his journey. And I think it's very typical of the Japanese Issei men that were held at Fort Missoula. Unlike the WRA camps where many times they were sent to one camp and would spend the duration of the war there and maybe be transferred once, uh, they really moved the Japanese Issei men around quite a bit um, from you know obviously arrest Descent to Fort Missoula, and then in, in December of 41, he was put through his loyalty hearing in February of 42. Uh, they came down with their decision that he would then be recommended for internment for the duration of the war. Um, in April of 42, then he was transferred to Fort Sill. November of 42, Camp Livingston. Uh, June of 43, Santa Fe. And then uh, finally, and one of the common things you see when you read through the files is that uh, they constantly, or the, the hearing boards were receiving letters from the family, essentially begging to let father come home. Um, so finally, they were able to get through a process where he was allowed to join his family. So I put the word in paroled in quotes. Um, when they went through the hearings at Fort Missoula, they could, there could be one of three judgments. They could either be recommended for internment for the remainder of the war. They could be paroled, which meant they could join their family at one of the WRA camps or they could be released. And very, very few were released. Most of them were recommended for internment for the duration of the war. Um, but many of them were eventually paroled. But I mean, you look at the dates here, you're talking two years. So, you know, on, on December 7th, 1941, he was taken from his family. They weren't told where he was going. And he spent the next almost two full years without seeing his wife or his family, uh, which is incredibly tragic. Uh, and then finally, you'll see on November 15th, uh, 1945, he was released and was able to return to Los Angeles. Um, finally, I'll end with that. And here's my contact information. And I'm happy to share this in the chat box as well, too. I'll share my email. 
Uh, if anybody, I'll leave it up for another couple seconds here so you can jot it down if you want, but I'll share it in the, the email at least because it's a long one. I'll share that in the chat box. And with that, Frank, I'm going to stop sharing and I will pass it back to you. Thank you very much, Matt. And as you're sharing links, please also share the links to the YouTube videos to, okay. uh, uh, so we can have those while we're, while we're talking here. Yeah. Uh, so that's Matt uh, Lotzenheimer, uh, Fort Missoula Historical Museum. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Stan Shikuma here in Seattle with me is one of the earliest organizers of the Tule Lake pilgrimage, and he's now a leader of the Tule Lake Committee. Uh, what sets Tule Lake apart from the other nine camps is that it was the site designated as the WRA's segregation center for the imprisonment of the 12,000 who refused to answer the government's loyalty oath in 1943. 12,000, that's one out of every 10 incarcerees. Think about that. Uh, but for those 12,000, segregation at Tule Lake triggered a unique series of actions that led to revolt, martial law, a stockade, resegregation, renunciation, and for some, deportation. And so Stan is here to unpack all that for us. Stan, please take it away. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, <clears throat> Frank, and uh, thanks, Matt, for that great presentation. Also, thank you to Jaxi for sponsoring these panelists uh, and con this whole conference. Okay, I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Um, oops. Get back to the beginning. Okay, so um, so my talk is about Tule Lake Segregation Center. Uh, Subtitle is Resistance, Segregation, Isolation, and Renunciation. Uh, and just. Uh, to begin with, I'd just like to say that the history of the Tule Lake Segregation Center sort of reveals the long hidden and seldom acknowledged history of Japanese American resistance to Executive Order 9066. It provides a clear counterpoint to the more dominant narrative and frankly government approved or sanitized story of total compliance with EO 9066. Um, it points out that while experience ordeals of segregation, isolation, renunciation, almost none of the Tule Lake resistors ever had an actual hearing or trial, though they all should have. So just for some background on Tule Lake, um, it opened as the Tule Lake Relocation Center of the War Re Relocation Authority or WRA on May 27th of 1942, and was later renamed the Tule Lake Segregation Center in July of 43, and didn't close until March of 46, about six months after the end of World War II. Um, it's located in the Klamath Falls Basin in the northeast corner of California, about 35 miles south of Klamath Falls, Oregon. Uh, the closest town was Newell. It's actually Newell is where it's located. Uh, and it's on a high desert plateau <clears throat> at about 4,000 feet elevation. So it can be pretty warm in the summer, but uh, also pretty cold in the winter. Uh, and as uh, interestingly, Tule Lake is quite unique uh, um, among the 10 WRA camps. It was the first to open as a WRA camp in May of 42, and that was the last of the WRA camps to close in uh, July of 43. It was unique in many other ways and also infamous in other ways among the 10 WRA camps. It was the largest and the most overcrowded camp after it became the segregation center. They packed 18,000, nearly 18,800 people into a facility built for 15,000. It was the only camp to house people drawn from all nine of the other WRA camps because of segregation. It was the only camp to have its own isolation center, the only camp to have an on-site jail within a jail, meaning the stockade and the concrete jail. It was the only camp to be put under martial law with the US Army taking control of the camp for about two months uh, during its segregation, uh, actually preceding the segregation period. The camp 
it was a camp with the most people renouncing citizenship. Over 90% of those who renounced came from Tule Lake. And it was arguably the camp with the worst and certainly the, har the harshest and most militarized uh, camp administrations. Um, the application for leave clearance, uh, also known as the loyalty questionnaire and a uh, badly misnamed uh, questionnaire, um, was the reason for creating this, the segregation center. Um, the WRA had decided that they needed for public relations purposes to divide the Japanese community into loyal and disloyal it's because the whole um, justification given for clearing all the Japanese off the West Coast was that they could not tell who was loyal and who was disloyal. And by 1943, they wanted to get people out of the camps and move them further inland. Um, but they were getting a lot of resistance because everyone said, well, if they're so dangerous, you can't keep them on the West Coast. Why, why should we accept them here? And the WRA's thought was that uh, if you could, you know, because they had already said that we didn't know who was loyal and disloyal, if they could say that, well, these people are loyal and those people are disloyal, then the loyal ones could leave camp and it would um, be kind of a, a public relations win for them. Um, they did not expect that so many people would answer negatively or, or unsatisfactorily to the loyalty questionnaire. As it turned out, there were, uh, they had administered everyone over the age of 17 had to answer the questionnaire, uh, and which was about 77,000 people. Of those, um, 80, well, about 84% answered yes to the, the two pertinent questions were 27 and 28. Uh, regarding would you serve in the military and the other one was do you swear for swear allegiance to the Japanese emperor. So about 84% answered yes, yes. About 9% um, answered no, no. Another 4% refused to fill out the questionnaire at all. 3% uh, answered with a qualified answer, penciling in yes, but only if my parents are released or only if my rights are restored or only if you return me to my home, things like that. Uh, a few people just refused to answer, left, refused to answer, left that question blank and just went on through the rest of it. Um, and so in total about 16% did not give an acceptable answer, meaning yes, yes. Uh, but doesn't necessarily mean that they answered no, no, or answered no at all. Here's, uh, oh yeah, and Tule Lake was designated the segregation center because it had the largest number of those answering and unsatisfactorily, either no, no, or no, no answer, or not refusing the questionnaire completely. Here's a breakdown of um, people from other camps uh, who were sent into Tule Lake because they answered, gave an unsatisfactory answer. So you can see there are um, hundreds to thousands of people in every one of the other camps who gave an unsatisfactory answer and ended up being sent to Tule Lake. To clear space for them, they wanted to transfer out all the quote unquote loyal Japanese Americans out of Tule Lake. And on the right, you can see a list uh, of the numbers of people sent from Tule Lake out to other camps uh, after, uh, as part of the segregation transfers. It's interesting to note that there were um, several thousand, like at least 2,000 people who were yes, yes at Tule Lake who did not want to transfer one more time. And so they, they refused to leave. And there were about 4,000 that had answered no or some variation. So you had about 6,000, 6,500 people staying at Tule Lake. They added another 12,000 plus 
eventually there were some others that were added in from some of the DOJ camps. So that's why you ended up with about 18,800 people at Tule Lake at its peak. Oh, I uh, forgot to mention, so <clears throat> all of the people who were segregated to Tule Lake were supposed to have a hearing where they could explain their answers. And it was pretty much up to the camp administration, wherever they were, whether they would actually get uh, transferred to a segregation center at Tule Lake or not. So there are some people who answered no, no, or refused to answer. But um, because the project director at their camp um, looked at their case or talked to them personally and decided that they were actually okay, that they, they were able to stay in camp. Uh, a friend of mine, Chizu Omori, says that she still doesn't understand why um, her parents uh, were never taken away to Tule Lake because uh, she did, believes that they were no-nos and they had said that they wanted to go back to Japan, but they stayed at Poston throughout the war. Um, another way that the people at Tule Lake were um, unjustly treated was in the citizen isolation centers. So a citizen isolation center was a creation of the WRA for basically for troublemakers who they hadn't committed a crime, but they were causing problems for the uh, administration. Um, I think initially the, the largest number was um, people involved in the uh, riot, so-called riots at Manzanar. So when people got into trouble and they wanted to remove them from the camp, um, like at Tule Lake, they wanted to take people out of camp who had not answered the questionnaire, loyalty questionnaire. Uh, so they sent them to a county jail nearby. The sheriff said, you know, there is no charge. They haven't broken any laws and there is no charge, so we can't lock them up here. So in order to lock them up someplace, they created a, a citizen isolation center, a separate facility for Tule Lake, it was about 10 miles away, where they kept <clears throat> people that they wanted to isolate from the uh, general population. So the WRA set up, set up three of these, one in Moab, Utah uh, in early 43, one in Loop, Arizona to replace Moab when they ended up having too many people uh, that then they could handle at Moab. And then the Tule Lake one, uh, at, when they were going through the uh, segregation process and, and wanted to take people out. Uh, there's a quote here uh, from one of the people who was uh, with the WRA. The project director does not know why some of the men were sent there. I mean, talking about Loop. The men themselves don't know why they were sent there and requests for information go unanswered. So basically like all of these things, there were no charges, there were no uh, hearings, there were no trials, there was no oversight, and there was no timeline for how long um, people were, would be held. And some people will see this as a, an early prototype for current prisons like Guantanamo. At Tule Lake specifically, um, uh, as a segregation center, Tule Lake was uh, transformed into a maximum security prison, different than all the other WRA camps. They uh, put in a second man-proof fence, about eight feet tall and topped with barbed wire, added guard towers, increasing it from six around the perimeter of the camp to 19 plus three around the stockade, plus another six around the, the farm, uh, the only camp that had guard towers around their farm. They also added a battalion of 1,000 soldiers, U.S. Army soldiers, to be stationed outside the Tule Lake Gate, which included a cavalry unit, jeeps mounted with machine guns, and several tanks. The stockade <clears throat> was built in late 42 as an internal holding pen for those deemed as troublemakers by the, by the WRA. Uh, it went through three iterations. Uh, first, it was just three tents 
uh, in a little area that was fenced off and then they added some barracks and an enlarged uh, fenced off area. And eventually they made an even larger fenced in area and even built a concrete jail within it um, in 44. And again, um, everyone who was put into the stockade, the jail, the isolation center was never actually charged with any crime. They were most often, they were never told why they were being picked up and why they were being uh, incarcerated and also not told why, how long they would be there and they were not allowed to communicate with their families. On the subject of renunciation, <clears throat> uh, in July of 44, uh, FDR signed a public law called the Denaturalization Act of 44, which allowed citizens to renounce their citizenship. And in October of that year, WRA sent instructions to all camps to help facilitate the process. They were mainly interested in the people at Tule Lake. And the, the big thing is that it was illegal to deport US citizens. But if someone renounced their citizenship, then you could deport them. And um, that was one of the plans or the reasons why WRA wanted to have a renunciation law. In the end, oh, about 5,500 Nisei renounced their citizenship and over 5,400 of them were from Tule Lake. It's like over 95% of those renouncing citizenship were at Tule Lake. Um, and several thousands of them were eventually actually deported to Japan. Um, most of the people who renounced uh, were able to regain their citizenship, but only after lengthy legal processes that were spearheaded by attorney Wayne Collins, who uh, helped get almost 5,000 of those 5,400 renunciants um, to win their, to get back their citizenship. But it took decades, uh, like the last one was finished in um, 56 or maybe even later. Just to summarize some of the constitutional rights that were denied, abridged, or violated by the US government in regards to Japanese Americans, um, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the right to keep and bear arms, the right against unreasonable searches and seizures, the right to due process, the right to a speedy trial, and be, to be informed of pending charges, freedom from cruel and unusual punishments. So, all Japanese Americans suffered under um, loss of first, second, fourth, fifth, and sixth amendment rights. But those at Tule Lake were egregiously um, violated in accord with the fifth, sixth, and eighth amendments. Uh, and I think the whole story of resistance is one that is not recognized and seldom told and needs to be really looked at. Part of the tragedy of Tule Lake is the stigma and ostracism that those who were incarcerated there felt not just from the government, but from our own community, the Japanese American community after the war. So um, here's a few quotes, you know, show me the way to go home was written on the walls of the Tule Lake Jail. Um, Satsuki Ino, who uh, was born at Tule Lake, said those who answered no to the question were reviewed as draft dodgers, cowards, or loyalists to Japan, troublemakers. The legacy stayed for a lifetime. That was in 2017. And then Yukio Kawaratani, uh, in an article in the Pacific Citizen, <clears throat> said that for all these years, former Tule Lake inmates have been stigmatized as troublemakers by the Japanese American community. They don't understand that we were trapped and highly victimized by the government and our families suffered because of the stigmatization. Oops. Uh, many Nikkei, Nisei chose to stay in the closet like LGBTs and not admit they were in Tule Lake. So if you think about it, 
roughly before and after segregation, one in four or one in five Japanese Americans were at Tule Lake uh, at one time or another. But I can guarantee if you ever walked into a room full of Nisei and said, hey, how many of you are at Tule Lake? You would not see one in five hands go up. So just to end with uh, a few things, we should remember that these things still happen and that uh, we should stop repeating history and that never again is now. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Stan. A uh, very uh, dense subject, Tule Lake is. And since we have so many uh, uh, opinion leaders here watching us uh, today, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, there is much more work to be done in Tule Lake. And I echo uh, Stan's thought that uh, more research needs to be done. Uh, uh, we could do a whole hour just on um, renunciation or an hour on segregation and deportations. And so, again, a, a lot to unpack in that. So thank you, Stan. Um, we do cover to the lake and all the points that Stan mentioned, uh, dramatize them, uh, I should say, in our graphic novel, We Hereby Refuse, uh, which is funded by a Jack's grant through the Wimu Museum. So um, I'll be drawing, uh, I've been asked to speak, uh, I'm the third speaker, uh, to, about the trials involving the draft resistance, the camp resistors who, who resisted the draft inside the camp. So I'll be drawing from two of my works, the new graphic novel, as I say, and my documentary from 2000, uh, Conscience in the Constitution. Um, Conscience in the Constitution aired in November 30th, 2000 on PBS nationally. And uh, it was actually funded by, a, uh, by the Civil Liberties Public Education Fund, which is a precursor to the NPS uh, Confinement Sites Grant Program. And I look at this poster and I think 20 years, man, uh, that's a generation. Uh, and, you know, 20 years ago, Stan, and Stan knows this very well, you know, you did not talk about camp resistance, uh, either draft resistors or being from Chile Lake uh, in polite Japanese American society. It was uh, not a subject for polite conversation. So this my film on the Heart Mountain Resistors appeared around the same time as uh, the Omori Sisters, Rabbit, Rabbit in the Moon, and Eric Muller's uh, fine book on free to die for their country on draft resistance. And, and together, you know, our works broke the ice on the uh, discussion of camp resistance. But again, just 20 years ago. Um, and I, I realize now that the result is that, that younger and Nikkei have grown up, you know, my, my children's generation has grown up with the story of camp resistance as something they've heard about almost, almost an accepted part of our, of our community history. Um, uh, so that when the Wing Luke Museum in Seattle got a grant from Jax to produce three graphic novels on the incarceration experience, it was natural for them to include Camp Resistance as one of the three stories. Now, I was very grateful for that. So in a moment, I'll, I'll come back to the story of draft resistance, first through the organized protest of the Issei mothers, then through the organized resistance of the Fair Play Committee at Heart Mountain, and then through the unorganized resistance at Minidoka. But I want to start by circling back to Matt's presentation on uh, Fort Missoula and the Issei who are brought before the alien enemy hearing boards at Fort Missoula. So in our graphic novel, We Hereby Refuse, we show you the process by which the Issei uh, arrived at the DOJ camp in Missoula. They were arrested by the FBI. Uh, the FBI arrested uh, 51 Issei in Seattle. Uh, after Pearl Harbor, and another 100 in a second sweep of Seattle in February 1942. And Jim Okutsu's father, uh, one of our theme characters in the graphic novel is Jim Okutsu, uh, his father was taken away um, uh, in a second sweep in February. Uh, and as you know, Matt was saying that there's an A, B, and C list, I don't know where Jim's father lay, list, fit on that list because he was just a cobbler. He was a shoe repairman. He owned a business. and. Uh, uh, as I said, the magazine was see uh, in Japanese was seized at, at their home, which would later come up in his uh, hearing. So Jim was uh, Jim, Mr. Akutsu was arrested by the FBI, taken away, and held at the immigration detention station in Seattle. Uh, the men were, were walked over to nearby King Street Station, where they were put on a train for Missoula, Montana. So I want to show this to Matt to show you that this is the other end of the pipeline to your 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 facility your your site uh, at the train station 
uh, in Seattle, King Street Station, wives and mothers screamed out their goodbyes in Japanese and English, not knowing if they would ever see their loved ones again. Um, there's the train, and there's the train headed to Fort Missoula, Matt, uh, you know, de destination uh, Montana. So for our graphic novel, I wish I had known when I was writing it about the restored courtroom that you showed us at Fort Missoula. Uh, as Matt said, that's where 1,000 Issei uh, were uh, brought before the Alien Enemy Hearing Board, which was made up of civilians from the local community, uh, uh, attorneys, uh, shopkeepers, uh, um, just uh, ordinary men. Uh, I think some were there some women on, on there too, but I know there are a lot of uh, just ordinary townspeople, uh, not government officials, on those Alien Enemy Hearing Boards. Uh, asking questions of people like Mr. Uh, Kiyonosuke Okutsu uh, uh, about their, to test, to try and determine whether they were at all harboring dangerous suspicions or da dangerous loyalties to the Empire of Japan. And you can see uh, these questions. Uh, this magazine we found at your home, does it, it says it means fatherland, doesn't it? No, it's more like homeland. Uh, I bought it as a favor to a friend. Uh, you taught uh, combat. You, you taught uh, Dai Nippon Butoku Kai uh, combat, which is taught to Japanese soldiers. You remember that group? Uh, yeah, I belong to that group. It's, it's Kendo. I was helping around the gym like other fathers. Um, these are questions that Mr. Kutsu answered to the Alien Enemy Hearing Board in Montana. I, I, Rather than draw that, we, we simply set this in the um, immigration station in Seattle before the train ride to um, Missoula. And, and story-wise, it worked out a little bit because it just gave us a chance to, to show that, that interrogation. And, and it made sense because the, 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 the same basic information was being sought. Are you a spy? And what were you doing subscribing to this magazine in Japanese that we see from your home? Um, so in this interrogation, uh, the key question the, the FBI had was, what country do you want to see win this war, Japan or United States? And in the transcript uh, of the uh, Alien Enemy Hearing Board, that's his answer. You know, uh, I like to see this country win. Uh, I spend all my life here. My family is here. My home is here. So that, that translated into the, into the um, substance of the scene for a graphic novel. So now uh, uh, this brings us back to Jim Akutsu and the story of uh, draft resistance. While Jim's father was being held at Missoula, Jim Akutsu and his brother Gene and their mother are sent to the WRA camp at Minidoka, Idaho. And that's where they're confronted by the war's decision to reinstitute the draft for the Nisean camp. This action comes two years after their removal from their homes and one year after the loyalty questionnaire. Uh, so for Jim and Jean at Benidoka, and for Frank, Emmy, and others at Hard Mountain, this was the last straw. They said, enough, 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 enough's enough. What's little known, uh, I want to mention, is the, the first coordinated public resistance to the draft comes not from the men, but from their immigrant mothers. Uh, it was a group of Issei women at Minidoka who wrote this petition to the president to president roosevelt <clears throat> pleading with him to restore the rights of citizenship to their sons before sending them to the front and 100 women signed it as the mother society of minidoka they opened the letter by declaring they came to this country because of its ideals and i just want to read a little bit to you uh, we the parents of citizens of japanese ancestry longed for america land of the free and equal we left behind our familiar birthplace and came to a great distance to this country. And in this land of strange language and customs, struggling against innumerable obstacles, we attempted to gain a secure means of living in time with grace of God. And in time with grace of God, our children were born in this country and we brought them up as splendid American citizens who could be, who could be pointed to with pride. Uh, this letter was written by Mrs. Fuyo Tanagi, who was a former assistant editor of a newspaper here in Seattle, uh, the, the Hokubei Jiji newspaper. And uh, she, in this letter, uh, it's a picture of Mrs. Tanagi, she, in the letter she pivots then to the country failing to live up to its ideals. Uh, however, on the Pacific coast, with the so-called military necessity as reason the foundation of our, of our 
for as reason for our incarceration, the foundation of our life, the fruit of several decades of toil and suffering was completely overturned. The Nisei's draft classification was changed to 4C. They were considered enemy aliens. This is, this is, this is an Issei woman writing this. The blow to their spirit they suffered at this time was something we could hardly bear to witness. But unfortunately, the American public does not listen to the truth. And it seems that the discrimination against them is becoming even more intense, even within the military camps. They are in a state of constant anguish. We understand that the purpose for which the United States is allowing tremendous sacrifices in fighting the war today is to establish, quote unquote, freedom and equality, unquote, throughout the world. When they, the Nisei, consider the purpose of this war and then think about the treatment they are receiving at present, they discover the existence of a great paradox. They are dejected and now have lost their firm, unshakable faith and spirit. To think of sending them in this condition to the front, we as mothers, considering the past and the future, feel an extreme and unbearable anguish. Uh, so 100 Issei women at Minidoka signed this, uh, very respectfully, yours, Mother's Society. Uh, their, their tone, I think, is restrained and respectful but deeply heartfelt, and as she says, anguished. Um, Issei women at the camps at uh, Amachi, Poston, and Topaz wrote similar petitions. Um, I bring this up so you can see that this is a teachable moment uh, for the educators among the viewers, uh, among the, around the agency of women in the camp, because we hear so little about the women, and this is a, a legitimate, uh, verifiable, factual story of 100 women uh, at one of camps, and there are three other through the camps, three other groups, uh, taking charge taking charge of their of their lives by uh, standing up to the government uh, and writing these letters. Uh, so, this Minidoka letter comes before the action at Heart Mountain, Wyoming, where the Fair Play Committee begins organized informational meetings around the unconstitutionality of the draft and of the camps themselves. Uh, these meetings draw 400 people at a time packed into mess halls, eager to hear information that they're not getting from the army recruiters or from the camp administration. Uh, uh, as I mentioned that my film, uh, in, in the film we show you how the FPC issued bulletins, collected dues, and built momentum. So I want to show you a clip uh, under two minutes showing the point at which their organizing becomes reaches a critical mass. The first group of draftees was told to report. When the day arrived, all 17 boarded the bus that took them to their pre-induction physicals. If the Fair Play Committee was to make a difference, it had to do more than protest. Some wavered. I remember arguing that if we don't take a definite stand, it's not going to do any good. At a packed mess hall rally, the Fair Play Committee crossed the line from protest to resistance. We feel the present program of drafting us from this concentration camp is unjust, unconstitutional, and against all principles of civilized usage. Therefore, we members of the Fair Play Committee hereby refuse to go to the physical examination or to the induction if or when we are called in order to contest the issue. If ever there was a time or... I didn't feel there was really a choice. We all had an obligation, a responsibility to publicize or to raise the issue of the incarceration, the uh, evacuation, at whatever opportunity we had. This certainly presented an opportunity, one that um, uh, if we were to overlook it at this point, then we virtually accept the evacuation as a normal condition. So the point that Yosh makes there the first at group the end, of draftees. The point that Yosh makes there at the end is very important. The draft resistance was not a protest against war, against war itself, uh, like it was in the Vietnam era. These were not pacifists or conscientious objectors. 
This was a protest against the camps themselves. They were ready to fight. Selective service was just the last law that they could break to get their day in a courtroom, just like this one at the federal courthouse in Cheyenne, Wyoming, to argue not about the draft, but about the unconstitutionality of the camps themselves. The draft was just their last chance they had to get their day in court. Uh, so yes, they had a test case. But when they get to federal court in Cheyenne, for what turns out to be the largest mass trial in Wyoming history, and the largest trial for draft resistance in US history, uh, the judge in their bench trial refuses to hear any constitutional or moral arguments. Uh, he rules strictly on, on the letter of the law. You fail to report for induction, doesn't matter your reason, you're all guilty of draft evasion. Sentenced to three years, three months, federal penitentiary. So that's the Hard Mountain story. At Minidoka, back to Minidoka, Jim Akutsu reads in the Rocky Shimpo newspaper about the Fair Play Committee. He writes to Frank Yemi and James Amura for advice. They write back to advise him to argue constitutional rights and to organize as a group. Um, that's not possible at Minidoka for a lot of reasons. Jim realizes they're on their own. He and his brother Gene both refuse to report for induction at Minidoka and are taken to a jail in Idaho where they're tried for draft evasion. And much like the judge in the Wyoming trial, the federal judge in Idaho refuses to allow the jury to consider any constitutional issues. So the jury takes just a few minutes, uh, enough time to smoke a cigarette, go out and come back, return verdicts of guilty. Uh, they're sentenced to three years and three months at McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary, just south of here in Seattle. Um, there, the Minidoka resistors meet up with the Heart Mountain resistors uh, in, in, in prison, and also with Gordon Hirabayashi, uh, who was also drafted after losing his Supreme Court test case. And as a Quaker, Gordon uh, refused the draft as a conscientious objector. So he was a conscious objector uh, uh, and not a, uh, a resistor on the constitutional issue. Uh, so just that was a real, uh, just a gallop, a real quick uh, run through uh, three examples of camp resistance around the question of selective service. Uh, we've heard, so we've heard from trials of suspicion, uh, the loyalty boards in, uh, in, in Missoula, and trials of segregation at to the lake and now selective service. Why is it important to know about the draft resistance in camp? One reason is that by going to federal court, the draft resistors address the constitutional issues of camp in a way that military service did not. Just a very quick point. The idea of spilling one's blood for America was about appealing to public opinion. Uh, the resistors fought on their own battlefield. Uh, not in the court of public opinion, but in a court of law. So thank you very much. That's my presentation. Uh, this concludes our three presentations on judicial or quasi-judicial processes that were convened for the incarcerees. Uh, before we get to questions from our viewers, I have a couple of questions of my own. Uh, my questions for Matt is uh, the, um, you made the good point that the uh, Issei were ineligible for citizenship. Uh, and that's why they were considered as enemy aliens. Um, uh, you know, Roger Daniels is always going after us about not calling the WRA camps internment camps. Fort Missoula is the only true, uh, the DOJ camps are the only true internment camps because they held the aliens. Uh, my, my question, is, is, Matt, is do you have tours now of the courtroom and of, of Fort Missoula? Is it, is, are you guys open now? Uh, how can we arrange uh, visits there? Sure, so we are, our site is open. Uh, year round. Uh, typically, we do close a lot of our outbuildings and the courtroom is in one of the buildings that is is not generally accessible. We have a barrack building that has a gallery style exhibit. We have an exhibit in our main building. But uh, the kind of the short answer to your question, Frank, is that uh, anybody that's interested in tours, if they reach out to us, we're happy to take them into that space and, and give a, a tour of that. Um, so it's not something where because of security issues, we can't have people just wandering in and out. But you know, with a request, we're happy to provide someone a tour of that or show them the courtroom. Oh, so it's not, it's not open to the public on a daily basis? No, not the courtroom. Okay. Uh, our museum is. The museum is, and we do have an original barrack that's set up with a gallery style exhibit that tells the story of Fort Missoula. All that's open on a daily basis. But uh -huh. uh, the courtroom, because it's in a larger building that's not fully developed yet, it has to be more of a folks that reach out to us. We're happy to show it to them. Is, is your facility with the COVID restrictions, are you open or closed or what, what are the procedures? So we're open. Um, 
right now, um, I mean, I guess it's, we're getting to the COVID stuff, but uh, we do require masks. We, unfortunately, Montana has been very interesting as far as the rules they put in place and uh, they've outlawed a lot of the mandates and things like that. But we are open to the general public right now. We are asking folks to wear masks inside the building, um, but, and we are still doing school tours. We actually had um, three local high school groups that came out and toured the courtroom and toured um, our ADC barrack this week. Oh, okay. As a practical question, I mean, I want to come out and see us now yeah. uh, when I'm able. Uh, what what airport do people fly into to get to your facility, and how, how do we how do you drive there? Or, sure. uh, or and also lodging. Is there lodging nearby? There is. Uh, so it, you know, I'm, hopefully none of the folks that are living in Seattle or LA are going to chuckle at this, but Missoula is actually the I believe we're still the second largest city in the state of Montana, which means that uh, they're about. 75,000 permanent residents in the, in the city, uh, which is which qualifies as a city in the state of Montana. But there is an international airport here at Missoula. Uh, there's plenty of lodging options. Uh, Missoula is kind of, essentially it's located about halfway between Yellowstone National Park and Glacier National Park. So a lot of folks fly into Missoula and there's plenty of lodging options. Um, a really kind of artsy fun downtown. So uh, it's, it's a great place to visit. Wonderful. Um... Uh, Stan, I don't have many questions for you. I mean, your, your presentation was so comprehensive. Uh, Tule Lake pilgrimage uh, ha couldn't happen last year. Uh, any any forecast for for the next uh, 2022 summer? <clears throat> yeah, that's the million dollar question. So we are we just had a meeting uh, of the Tule Lake pilgrimage committee um, and are tentatively putting our foot in. So <clears throat> we're making all the reservations like for lodging and buses and stuff, because that ha needs to be done now if we're going to do something in July of 2022. But we probably won't make a final decision until spring. Right. Uh, you know. yeah. so, sorry to put you on the spot there, Stan, but I mean, I, I think people want to know. So it's, it's a possibility. It's a possibility, but it really depends on what the pandemic look like looks like come and no February more or March. Of course, of course. So everyone who's watching, uh, thank you for hanging with us. Thirty-two of you watching right now. Um, I'm going to go back now. Please, please leave your questions in the Q and A for Stan, Matt, or myself. I'm going to go back to now the questions we have uh, from Julie Abo. Julie's been very patient. Uh, Matt, Julie wants to know. You mentioned the ABC list, uh, and can you give us more idea? What were those organizations? deemed the threat and and when and how did that designation occur and and, and who made those designations was, was it the doj or the fbi um and do those kinds of well th th those two questions first of all sure so you know from my reading of it i mean it could be any fraternal organization so these were kind of clubs and fraternal organizations that existed within the japanese american community and any of those clubs could be deemed as you know and it's, it's kind of like I think of it today, I mean, almost like an Elks Club or something like that. To work. But it, it's any kind of a fraternal or a social organization, but it was where Japanese Americans and Issei men were gathering and they were part of these organizations, which completely makes sense because there's, there's elements of the culture that they would gather together to celebrate. But just doing something as simple as that potentially got you on one of these lists. Uh, the second part, I think a lot of it came through the FBI when they started putting together the lists. Um, there was one in particular, there was a, a Japanese uh, Naval Society, I believe, and I can't remember the, the Japanese name for it, uh, but it was something where one of the men that had been involved in it from an international standpoint, they raided a hotel room and that's where they got the list of all the members of it. And then they used that. So they would, they would interrogate and pressure people that were involved in these organizations to give up names of all the people that were members. And then that was how they would add them to the ABC list. Um, you mentioned in your graphic novel about the man who was, how he ended which list. And I'm guessing it was simply being a business owner. Um, what the federal government was looking at was anyone that they felt like had influence over the Japanese American community. And because these Issei men had been here for decades and they had been successful, they were viewed as potentially having influence over the Japanese American community. So that gets them landed on this list. Um, which, you know, and again, the vast majority of these organ all these organizations were essentially more fraternal organizations and ways for people to gather and socialize, but yet that 
deemed you as potentially being disloyal. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, John Okada's father was a member. He operated a hotel, which you know had some influence, I suppose. But he was also a member of like the Japanese Chamber of Commerce in Seattle. So uh, I think you mentioned fraternal organizations. I think business chambers. Yep. All, all a lot of these guys belong to these you know uh, groups. You know, like you say, like the Lions Club as opposed to the Elks Club. Yeah, perhaps. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, Christine Dennehy has a related question for you, Matt. Uh, she'd like to know more about the civilian or the alien enemy hearing boards in Missoula. Uh, and I, I fumbled the answer on who served on those. Uh, uh, what can you tell us about the, the makeup of these enemy, alien enemy hearing boards uh, um, and who served on them? Sure. So there were, so from my reading, there were, there were roughly three people that were deemed to be the judges or to, to determine what to do with uh, the, the men. Um, typically they would try to find three men from the community that the men were from, but that wasn't always possible. So we do know there was a judge from Great Falls in Montana that served on the board. Uh, there was an attorney from Missoula. Uh, interestingly, one of the names that pops up who had a much different career later on, uh, there was a legislator from Montana by the name of Mike Mansfield. And Mike Mansfield would go on to be the, uh, the, yeah, Trying to think the ambassador to Japan, I think. Yeah, he was the ambassador to Japan. You're correct. Um, but when he was in his 20s as a young attorney in Missoula, he actually was one of the judges that served on the panel uh, in the event that they couldn't get three judges to do it. Uh, another interesting fact about them that I forgot to mention in my presentation is uh, the they did provide interpreters for some of the, the men that weren't fluent in English, but the interpreters they chose were Korean American interpreters. That were there to interpret for the Japanese man, men to the boards. Um, the Korean men also were involved in the interrogation of the Japanese Issei men before the trials took place. And the only um, incidents we have from our camp of any kind of violence towards these men actually involved the Korean interpreters um, getting rough with uh, the Japanese Issei men. So uh, that's the only example we have of that. Wait, wait, wait. The Korean interpreters got rough with the Issei men? Yes. Not, not vice interrogation. Yeah. No, not they vice actually, versa. What's that? Not not vice versa. I mean, no. the Japanese were not rough no. with the Korean. No, the Korean, the Korean men who were doing the interrogation or acting as the translators were getting violent. There are actually three of them were the, the were dismissed from that role because there was an investigation because uh, some of the Issei men complained to the camp director and they actually conducted an investigation. They dismissed three of the translators. Uh, for that reason. But that's that's the only real example we hear of, of violence towards these Issei men at Fort Missoula. Well, that, that's incredible, Matt, because usually it's, it's the other way around where Japanese, you know, having occupied Korea, you know, would, would be looking down on Koreans. So that, that's remarkable. Um, I have a question. Um, Stan, here's a question that Julia Abo has. I want to give it to you. Uh, Julie's wondering, why do you think the question of loyalty? Why do you think we don't discuss the absurdity of the question of loyalty? Do you think people still try to use this today? Oh, well, I, I think that's part of the problem with accepting government explanations for things, because that's how the government presented it. Um, and it was, it was, um, well, it's a couple of things. One is the ineptitude of, of the WRA in putting the loyalty question in with the military's will you serve question so conflates the two um, and ties them together which created a whole lot of confusion so like if i answer yes am i saying that i'll go to war but uh you know if i say no am i you know re, uh saying that i i'm no longer a citizen of japan even though i cannot by law become a citizen of the u.s and um, yeah. anyway, so, but the whole question of loyalty, um, I think takes a lot more than one or two questions on a, a, a three page survey, right? Right, yeah, yeah. the idea of, uh, I mean, Michi, Michi Wegman, when I talked to her, she was uh, uh, appalled at the idea of, you know, trying to determine one's loyalty uh, on, a, on a piece of paper. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think the whole point though is that, it's it's so ludicrous and you have to believe that that's not really the the point of i mean they must have realized that this was a ridiculous exercise 
on the basis of one question and say whether you're loyal or not. So, you know, I think it was a lot more effective in creating a division of good JAs and bad JAs that they could present to the public. And that was the real reason for it, uh, which was successful in that, you know, then a lot of people got to leave camp. Yeah. But it was also successful in dividing the community. Um, and that, that division continues to today. Exactly. I mean, my, my take on this is that the government essentially created an administrative class of disloyals by asking the question, because once you have the question uh, and someone answers yes, then they're on, on the, the loyal side. And if you put them on the no side, then the, the, their class, you, you have to you have to classify them as disloyal because they wouldn't say yes to the loyalty question. But these people were not as we know, disloyal to the government. It was simply, uh, th there are many reasons for answering or, or refusing to answer. Uh, and, and Stan, here's the thing. What if the government had, had administered the loyalty questionnaire before eviction, before expulsion, when we're still at home in Seattle or Los Angeles? If, if you know, would, would, the question, would the answers have been different if people had been asked the question before everything was taken away from them? Oh, certainly. <laughs> it would have been overwhelmingly yes. Exactly. Um, uh, so the timing of the questionnaire is important. Yeah, I mean, they'd been in, in camp for almost a year, just shy of a year, when they administ started administering it in February of, of 43. So everyone had already lost their farms, their businesses, their homes, their education, their friends, their all of that had been taken away from them. And then they were put in these camps with bad food, bad healthcare, yeah. uh, crowded conditions. <clears throat> and then you, you do that for a year and then you ask them, well, you know, do you want to declare your loyalty <laughs> yeah. to the government or not? How do you like it now? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. That so a, a lot yeah. of people were just totally ticked off and, and in that frame of mind said, I'm not going to cooperate anymore. As and, a form and, of and, 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 and let me just ask you one more question, Stan. Uh, did any of these people who answered no and therefore be classified as disloyal commit any acts of disloyalty against the government? No. While, in, never... while, while inside a prison camp, <laughs> did they commit acts of disloyalty? No. No. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Stan. Um, Shirley uh, Higuchi has a couple questions for us, too. Uh, uh, Shirley wants to know uh, if I know how many resistors are still alive. And this is a question that Kenji Tagama keeps asking me over and over again. Frank, how many Harp Mountain resistors or Amachi resistors are, are still alive? And it's, it's very few. Uh, it's 2021 now. It's been 80 years. Uh, we have Tak. Yeah, Shirley, oh, you, yeah, Shirley, you know Tak Koshizaki, of course. I mean, Tak Koshizaki is the last Harp Mountain draft resistor who is alive and. Um, able to speak. Uh, one fellow, uh, Ichiro, Yomita, uh, Ichiro Morita, uh, ran a, a Morita photo studio in Sunnyvale. Uh, I talked to his mother, I'm sorry, his mother, his, his wife and his daughter, uh, but he's, he's not um, uh, lucid is the word I'm looking for. Uh, so um, we lost Yosh, we lost Frank Emmy. And so, uh, no, it, we, I th as far as I know, there's two Harp Mountain resistors alive. Uh, one Amachi resistor that Kenji had recently on, on online. Uh, Stan, how about you? How many resistors are you aware of are still alive? Oh. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Not many. Uh, any. I mean, any. Are you aware of any? Okay, well. No. Well, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, the, to actually be a resistor, you would have had to be like 18. Exactly, yeah. And so that means now you would be in your late 90s. 98, yeah. At least. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 80, 80 years ago. Um, and Stan surely wants to know, uh, can you quickly fill us in on your family's incarceration history, mother slash father? Okay, so my mother's family was in Shelton, Washington. They got taken away to Tule Lake directly. Oh. oh. Um, they were, uh, I think they were there within two weeks of it opening. Um, oh. uh, and my father's, and, and but she got out just before segregation and my grandfather, grandmother, and my youngest uncle uh, transferred out to Amachi, Colorado. 
Uh, my father's side of the family was in Watsonville, California, and they got sent first to Salinas Fairgrounds and then to Post in Arizona. Okay. So you have skin in the game on, on Chile Lake, at least. That's on your mother's side. Uh, my, my, my father was at Heart Mountain, uh, uh, Wyoming. Uh, uh, he was, I think, too young for the draft, but uh, so that's a long story. And um, my mother was actually uh, in Japan. She, my mother, Kibe. So my mother, my mother Shirley, was born in San Jose. Father took her back to Japan uh, before the war, and she got stuck there. Uh, so my mother was actually, uh, I think, making Japanese zeros uh, in a factory with other high school girls, uh, making these terrible rivets on planes that wouldn't fly. Um, uh, and then she was able to get back in 1950 when uh, it's a long story. Uh, so we have a few more minutes left. Uh, one, I think one last question from Setsuko Winchester. How much involvement did Colonel Carl Bendetson, self-described architect of internment, have at Tilly Lake or Fort Missoula? Interesting. Um, uh, uh, Matt, are you aware of any involvement? No, I mean, uh, Colonel Carl Bendetson in the Western Defense Command second in command or, you know, to John DeWitt, Fort Missoula was already built as an army facility, wasn't it? Yeah, and I, I, I haven't run across that name in anything related to Fort Missoula. Of mm -hmm. course, our camp was a DOJ camp and it was administered by the INS. So um, I don't know if that would impact it or not, but I'm, I don't know of any involvement at Fort Missoula. Yeah, uh, in terms of Chile Lake, Setsuko, um, there is online an interview with Carl Bendetson, oral history interview at the, I want to say the Franklin Roosevelt Library, it could be the Truman Library, one of those presidential libraries where um, he is interviewed about this uh, selection, of the uh, sites for the camps, and um, this, his discussion of how to use trains, with the incarceraries back and forth between the camps. And, and I, as I wrote in the graphic novel, uh, he did advise Dylan Meyer, the, of the, the director of the WRA, on this, the, the selection of Tudley Lake as a segregation center uh, that because Dylan Meyer told him that Tudley Lake had the largest number of, you know, refuseniks, people who refused the questionnaire. And so it made logistical sense to have, to designate Chile Lake as a segregation center, as opposed to say Heart Mountain, because there were more, again, uh, refuseniks there. And um, he, he, Ben Detson told Meyer he didn't have the wood or the, you know, the, the supplies to build him a separate segregation center. Dylan Meyer asked Carl Ben Detson in this interview, uh, which I'm trying to remember desperately, um, that uh, can you can you build me a new segregation center? And Ben said, no, I, we don't have the material. We need we need we need the material for the war effort. Uh, so let's. My my proposal to you, Mr. Meyer, is take an existing camp, let's say Tule Lake, and you know move the segregates in, and then move the the others out, and then that was the process uh, uh, by which the segregation happened. And so that's that would be my answer on, on Ben Detson's pretty, pretty direct involvement, pretty direct involvement in the creation of the segregation center. So uh, if there's any more questions, uh, this is, oh, Setsuko Winchester, uh, there's a good bio. Oh, yes, the uh, Clancy Denevers book uh, Curl, the, has a book, uh, The Curl and the Pacifist is a very good book about uh, Carl Ben Detson and um, someone else. Uh, we never see him mentioned. Well, I mean, uh, I mentioned, Setsuko said we, we never see Ben Detson mentioned. I, I feature him as a character in my emigraphic novels, so 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 there. Uh, and uh, if you look in uh, um, Resistance at Tule Lake, uh, I'm sure he's in there too as well, the film uh, by Conrad Adenauer. So uh, we can talk some more Setsuko offline if you'd like. Uh, with that, uh, Matt, any last words? Uh, actually, Frank, I have a quick question for you. Uh, what's the best way that folks can get a copy of your graphic novel? Any online seller, okay. order through your local bookseller. I prefer you go through your local bookseller. Support independent bookstores. Uh, Bookshop.org is one. Uh, and of course, the evil empire Amazon is always. Uh, uh, yeah. we, the Wing Luke has a, our, our book is actually in short supply. We got to go to a third printing now. We're selling out fast. So if you can't find it online, the Wing Luke Museum has a good supply. 
uh, that I know of. So we can also get the Wing Loop Museum. But thank you. Thanks for asking. Thanks. And actually, as far as final words, I just uh, just thank you to, to everyone for taking the time to tune in today and uh, for allowing us to kind of share the story and raise awareness of Fort Missoula and the things we're doing uh, here in Montana. So, and of course, an open invitation, anybody that finds themselves in Missoula, please reach out to me. I'm happy to show you around the site uh, and give you a tour and we can show you the courtroom. So thank you. You're on that. I'm, I'm gonna take you up on that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll see you next year. Yes. Stan, any last yeah. words from you, Stan? Uh, I would also like to thank uh, everyone involved and the Japanese American Confinement Sites Consortium for putting this on. And um, it's a really, JAXI is a really good way to learn about all these um, different confinement sites that we're just discovering or, you know, coming up to the surface now. Because it isn't just those 10 WRA camps, um, places like Fort Missoula, Tuna Canyon, Santa Fe, Moab, um, they're important too, because I think we need to get a, a whole scope of the depth of violation that happened in 42 and 43 and 44 and 45, and even beyond like at Crystal City. Um, and so thank you for participating. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, Matt. And thank you all uh, at the uh, Confinement Sites Consortium. Uh, this is our program. Thank you very much. Good, good afternoon.